Today we're going to be taking a look at the second boss in Blackwing Lair, Veilstra's the Corrupt, or better known as the Guildbreaker. If you were to take a look at this boss on paper, you'd realize that it's actually not terribly hard fight mechanically, uh, but what makes this fight so challenging, some even comparing it to Nefarian in terms of difficulty, is the fact that for the first time in classic raids, everyone carries the burden of responsibility. Uh, as I had stressed in my last video, threat is going to be the overarching mechanic here, in this fight especially. We're going to look how to overcome this challenge, uh, what strategy I'll be using with my guild specifically, uh, position of the raid during the fight, tank swapping, which is a huge part of successfully completing this encounter, and of course, my favorite topic, threat management. Before we get too far into this video, I'd also like to take a moment to thank Skarm for letting me use his Veilster's video, as well as the raid encounters for letting me use the video I used in my last guide, as well as uh, I'll be using it a little bit in this guide as well. Uh, before we dive into the boss and his mechanics, uh, we're going to first talk about another encounter in this same room that is equally as important, the Blackwing Technicians. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out about the two videos I'm using for reference is the first one, which is a continuation of my last video uh, video's reference, which is from the Raid Encounters. Once again, thank you guys for letting me use your video. Um, and the second one being Skarm's video. Uh, I would like to just say now that don't really worry about the kind of uh, this setup, the raid positioning of the first video that we're looking at, the one from Dynasty. That's not the actual raid position that I would recommend, at least, and that uh, I'm going to be using with my guild. So... Pay no attention, it's just kind of to show you the room, the kind of layout, and where the tank is more importantly, and uh, generally just where not to stand is ranged. Everyone should be on the ground floor, which we'll talk about later. There are six goblin technicians which are present in Veilstress Chamber uh, the first time you enter each week. These are a recurring mob that you will see a lot later on in the, the instance, however, uh, these mobs are super important, especially if you have someone like myself who has both bindings for Thunder Fury, as they are used to actually uh, create Thunder Fury. You need 10 Elementum Ingots, which drop from these uh, technicians, and they have a very, very low chance of dropping. So it's important to make sure that you're tagging all six of these to give you uh, just a better possibility to get as many uh, Elementum Ingots as you possibly can. These mobs are not particularly dangerous until later on in the raid, so the main priority is tagging them and killing them. As long as you tag all of them, you shouldn't have too much trouble actually killing them here. The strategy I'll be employing in my guild will be a simple uh, split. Odd groups head to the northeast corner of the chamber to cut off the three techs who head towards the north ramp. Those in even groups go to the southeast corner of Vale's room to grab the technicians making a break for the south ramp, utilizing any kind of movement abilities to ensure you tag all six of them. Once you've tagged all, uh, tagged and killed all six techs, and hopefully gotten a few element team gets, or at least one, you can start to get in position and prepare yourself for the actual boss fight itself with fail stress. The giant red dragon sleeping in the middle of the room is the NPC that has the ability to wipe your 40-man raid in about three seconds. So to start the encounter, you must awaken the sleeping dragon by talking to him. Once you talk to him, you have one hour to kill him. If you wipe, that is fine. You just won't have the privilege of setting up as well as you can after he's awake. Uh, if you are unable to kill him with one hour of waking him up, he will despawn for 12 hours. So basically, if you can't kill him within the allotted time, your raid night is pretty much done for that night. Uh, if you do happen to wipe, which will happen, don't be afraid of it, and lose the advantage of getting players in place before engaging him, you are able to move around the room without aggroing him. There are pillars around the uh, outer edge of the room, which we'll be using later during the fight, actually, that act as kind of a barrier around Veil. Vale. Um, if you stay on the outside of this ring of pillars around the boss, you shouldn't accidentally aggro the boss before your raid is ready. Before diving into the abilities and raid position of Veil, vale, let's go over a few general bits of info about the fight. Uh, fire resistance is a must in this fight, since Veil vale will be using a fire-based AoE doing about 600 fire damage every three seconds. Make use of the buffs from Ubers for tanks and DPS as needed. Uh, this fight does have an aspect of randomness that can cause wipes for your guild. Burning adrenaline, which we'll go over later, hitting some of your best healers at the beginning of the fight, for example, can cause huge issues. Don't be frustrated from wipes on this boss and consider who the burning adrenaline hits during the encounter when looking back at wipes. It's important to consider. 
And with that information out of the way, let's go over some of the abilities Veilstress has. The first we'll go over is Essence of the Red, and this debuff is cast on the raid at the beginning of the encounter and lasts for 3 minutes. This restores 500 mana per second to mana users and restores 50 energy to rogues and feral cat druids and generates 20 rage per second for warriors and bear druids. The second ability is going to be one of the more important ones. It's called Burning Adrenaline. Veil vale only casts Burning Adrenaline in two scenarios. He will cast it on random mana users throughout the fight, and he will cast it on the current tank every 45 seconds. One tank killed every 45 seconds for three minutes equals four tanks. So you will need a minimum of four tanks for this fight. When the main tank is afflicted, healers must be ready to transition to the next tank while keeping the old one up at the same time until the debuff kills them. Thus, the fight requires at least four tanks in a threat building queue. This fight requires a lot of coordination, not only between the raid as a whole, but more specifically between your tanks. Uh, we'll go over where you can go to die with uh, whenever Burning Adrenaline kills you eventually uh, later on when we talk about the position of the raid, um, just so that way you'll kind of have an idea of where you can go and properly dig your own grave. Uh, just remember that the, the kicker of the spell is that it will only be cast on classes with mana, except for every third use, which is every 45 seconds. So just keep that in mind whenever you're taking a look at your raid composition as a whole. The next ability we'll go over is a cleave. This is a chain cleave, so if positioning is poor, it can and will chain to the entire raid, even if you're behind them. It is critical that nobody be within approximately 10 yards of the main tank for this reason. We'll go over raid positioning and how you can avoid this uh, here in just a little bit whenever we, we talk about raid positioning in general. The third ability we'll go over is his Flame Breath. This must be directed away from the raid by the main tank. Every Flame Breath applies a stacking debuff, also called Flame Breath, that ticks for a thousand-ish damage, fire damage every few seconds. As this is a stacking debuff, as the tank takes multiple breaths, the damage from this debuff will stack until it is ticking for around 4600 damage. This is a huge difference in how much DPS the tank is taking. Early on in the tank rotation of holding aggro, they'll take close to like 1200 DPS. Uh, by the time they're dying from burning adrenaline, they'll be closer to taking 2000 DPS. The difference in how much damage they're taking all comes from this one attack. And another ability that Veilstress has is his tail sweep. This is the same with pretty much any other dragon. Uh, don't get hit by the tail. Um, this will inflict about 600 to 1,000 damage to enemies in a cone behind the caster, knocking them back. And the last ability we'll go over is the Fire Damage Aura, which I kind of talked about a little earlier. Um, this aura does about 300 to 700 damage per tick. The best way to deal with this is by simply having a priest in each group uh, cast Max Rank Prayer Healing, since the mana region is no issue at all. Um, however, since you rarely have eight priest in a raid group, Shaman Chain Heals and Druid spamming Regrowth, Rejuve, and Heal as fast as possible uh, should also do the trick with this. With the abilities out of the way, let's go ahead and talk about positioning and where and where not to stand in Veil's room. First of all, like we had previously said, no one should be directly behind Veilstraz because he will cast Tail Sweep. Additionally, no one should be directly next to the main tank, which will be in front of him. Uh, your warriors will be fairly close, but not close enough so that they are hit by Flame Breath or Cleave. The best way to position him is by having your tanks at least 90 degrees away from your current tank, near his left shoulder. Melee DPS should be on, on the other side of the boss, on his right shoulder, staying in between his front and rear right legs. All casters, ranged DPS, and healers should be next to the wall directly across from the warriors, melee DPS side, on the other side of Veilstress, so on his right side. Note that when Veilstress applies Burning Adrenaline to a mana user, he will briefly turn to look at the mana user he's applying that to, but he shouldn't use any other attacks like his breath while turn to apply the BA. These momentary lapses of attention are acceptable and, and expected, so if you're the main tank, don't freak out if he momentarily turns and applies burning adrenaline to the uh, to a mana user. At the beginning of the fight, you will have your main tank facing Vale east towards the throne platform in the room. Vale should never be looking away from this direction, exception, as I previously said, for when he's casting BA on mana users. Now, where are you supposed to go when you're dying from burning adrenaline? Well, if you're the main tank, then you should just sit right where you are and get comfy. We'll talk about the main tank dying and tank swapping in just a little bit. But if you're anybody else who isn't the main tank, 
you're going to want to run far away from the raid. Now, I did some research and I searched and I searched, but I could not find or confirm the approximate AOE range from the explosion that burning adrenaline causes. So I'm just going to play it safe and say go for the old reliable pillar hugger strat. As you're dying from burning adrenaline, you're going to run behind the pillar by the door to Razor Core's room. As long as you're in the corner, then you should be more than far enough away from everybody as long as everybody is in the correct positions. As you find out what the exact range of that explosion is, you can adjust as needed uh, if you'd like, you know, just to die closer, I guess, to the group. Let's talk about tanking. This fight relies heavily upon tank coordination and threat management. I mean, really, besides the massive amount of people dying around you from adrenaline and the giant dragon breathing fire, hopefully not on your raid, this fight really comes down to just threat management. Let's get some general tanking info out of the way for this one. Uh, generally, I would like to shoot for 250 fire resistance and 7.5k HP to make this fight very, very manageable for myself and my healers. His stacking flame breath debuff is the real killer here. As you begin to reach max stacks of it and your total HP starts to drop by 5% every second. Let's take an example and kind of break down the opening of this fight from the tanking perspective. Let's go over kind of the first eight seconds of the fight. Uh, main tank goes in at one and start counting. Off tanks will go in at two to four seconds in and healing should start around three, uh, if not maybe a little sooner. At eight, all DPS will begin. By the time the first tank gets Burning Adrenaline, Veil Stress should be at 22%. 23% is okay, less is better. At 20%, he's vulnerable to execute, so warriors can get ready to go nuts. At 2 minutes left on the buff, Veil should be around 18% to 20%. And at 1 minute left, he should be at around 10-12%. to 12%. Hopefully, he was dead when the buff runs out, but if not, keep going. The last percentage is <laughs> the hardest. <laughs> Uh, now, of course, these numbers aren't really exact, so don't freak out if you're behind. Just make sure the raid team stays aware of the debuff timer and pushes appropriately. When the main tank gets burning adrenaline, he stays in position. The off tanks get ready to get aggro and immediately turn Vale back to the tank's position. During the transition, Vale must not move, so it is important for tanks to always stay within melee range of Vale. Occasionally on the transition, healers might get a tail whip or a short gap in the main tank healing occurs. Uh, to bridge that, we have two priests flashing the main tank. There will be a lot of fire damage throughout this fight, so it is important to mitigate it. Don't forget that you do have a strict time limit though, so there must be kind of an equal balance of fire resistance and kind of threat gen or pure DPS gear for, for the tanks. DPS also make sure that you're using any threat reducing abilities, prioritizing using them during tank transitions to make it easier for the tanks to make sure that, that they're the next on the threat list. Uh, but yeah, that's about it for the overall strategy of Veil. Um, we'll kind of go over and just recap a little bit, wrapping up Veil Stress, which is just keeping up the main tank until burning adrenaline hits, uh, and then letting that you know slowly will limit him down. Keeping the off tank topped off so they can survive the certain burst of damage that will occur when Veil Stress switches over after the main tank dies. Uh, keeping the tank order clear. It is a critical that the healers know who is next so they can prepare heals on that target. And the tanks need to know who is next so they can move into position. And w watch your positioning. Avoiding chain cleaves is huge in this fight. And last and certainly not least, DPS, please, please, please watch your threat. If you are second in the threat whenever the main tank dies and you don't use any kind of threat reducing abilities, you are more than likely going to wipe your raid right then. So it's very, very important to make sure that you're always, always, always below the next off tank that should be tanking the boss. And with that all being said, I just want to say thanks for watching all. I hope you took something valuable from this and are able to go and crush Veil uh, in BWL once it launches. I would also like to take this time to let you know that I will be creating a playlist of videos, taking you from the very first pull in BWL, which is Razor Gore, all the way to Neveria, and virtually every single mob in between. Uh, this will be available on my channel under my playlist. Not all the videos will be mine specifically, but they've all been handpicked by me and they'll all be the ones that uh, I'll be using with my guild. Uh, I will also be making at least one other video guide for sure, which will be Chromagus uh, and possibly one for Nefarian, but I've found pretty solid guides for pretty much every other boss and all the trash mobs in between. Um, and with BWO being only a week away at this point, this will give you plenty of time to go through and make sure that you know each and every encounter that you need to. 
I'd also like to say thank you for all the positive comments and likes on the last video. Uh, considering it was just the first guide I ever made really just tailored and focused towards my, my guild strategy that I want them to focus on. Uh, I'd like to say thank you all for, for the support of that. And I'm just really happy I could, uh, you know, be helpful and everyone could take something beneficial from that. So thank you all once again, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video.